All right, so I just watched a video from Jenks on the issue of gun control. It seems like he's very well intentioned. He's actually uh, being honest on this. He's trying to be as informed as he can. Uh, Jenks, I saw the video, man, and I'm going to give you props on that one. There are a lot of people on the gun control side from what I've seen that are either very in, ill informed and don't want to change that. There are several that are very dishonest, uh, and there are several that are just not willing to have that civil discussion like Shannon Watts claimed she did. In fact, Shannon Watts has got me blocked on Twitter, as well as a lot of other gun controllers. And I think it's a good thing that you wanted to come forward and have an honest discussion on the issue, as you say right here. So anyway, let me know what you think. And I want to see some good debate here. I was talking with somebody, and I said I would mention this in the video. They, they corrected me on a grammar. Students does not need an apostrophe. Thank you so much for pointing that out, Jesus Christ. I really do appreciate that. Debate ha can be civil. It can be. And I want to see a civil debate. Let's show these fucking SJWs what civil debate looks like. So, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you on this one right here. We can have a civil debate on this issue. Uh, again, this is going to be a long video. It, it's going to be real dry, and I hope to... I know I'm not going to change your mind overnight on this one, man, but I just wanted to give you a little bit more information for your toolbox, so maybe you'll have a different perspective on this as well. And let me add out there to the pro-advocate, the advocates of guns, and to the anti-advocates of guns. Before you start clicking the unsubscribe button or the downvote button, listen to both sides of my arguments, because I, I do have, I'm kind of a, a pendulum on this one. All right. So, again, I'm subscribed to a lot of people on YouTube. I... A lot of them, I don't agree with them on everything. I, in fact, I think it's perfectly okay to have a discussion with somebody you disagree with. Uh, there's a big difference between, uh, obviously, a mere disagreement and just one person trying to be dishonest. And I see a lot of that on the gun control side, and I'll show you what I'm talking about as this video progresses. Uh, so, with that being said, man, I do want to continue on with a civil discussion, and I think you, in particular, are trying to be honest about this, trying to have a civil discussion. Uh, so, I do want to keep that up, and I do want to have an open dialogue on the issue. The Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, was originally created because the government, the founding fathers of our country, wanted us to have the ability to create a militia, so that if we ever needed to revolt against our government because they were becoming too big or they wanted to create an establishment that was based on something like communism or dicta dictatorial faction, that we as citizens had the ability to form a militia, rise up, make a civil war, and stand up to our government and say, no, we're not going to do that. If you think the guns that are sold over the counter to you or the guns that are sold on the black market or anything that can compete with the military that the government has under their arms, you are mistaken. The things that you can buy on the black market, the things that you can buy over the counter, they are no match for what the government can do to you. So the Second Amendment is kind of laughable at best because it's not really applicable today. So yes, this is true with your standard commercial off-the-shelf rifle. It's not going to stand much of a chance against the weapons that our U.S. armed services have on a conventional battlefield. With a civil war that you'd see within the United States, if a significant portion of the population decided, okay, uh, we're done, we're done playing nice, it's not going to be a conventional battlefield. It's going to probably fall under the insurgency, counterinsurgency operations, which are very nonlinear and very complex. Uh, suffice to say, you're not going to be able to solve it 
by rolling a battalion of tanks through the AO. It's just not going to happen that way. And in fact, using a battalion of tanks or an even larger element of tanks, aircraft, and so on and so forth, it's just going to make the situation worse. You can't shoot your way through counterinsurgency operations and solely rely on that to win, to say the least. Um, as on the Second Amendment, well, it's still in the Constitution. It, it still falls under what would be U.S. law. So I haven't seen anybody on the gun control side put forth a serious effort to change that. And me, I'm still going to stand up for the Second Amendment being in place for numerous reasons. And again, I'm going to explain that as we go on in the video. However, I find that these days, violence isn't really the answer, but there's a new form of warfare out there. It's called digital warfare. All right, so what you're talking about is information operations, and uh, that's actually been around since the time of our founders. It's one of the reasons why our founders put in the First Amendment, right to freedom of speech, right to freedom of press, right to peacefully assemble, and obviously the regulation or the restriction against Congress promoting or restricting any religion. Um, there's your basic First Amendment right there. And yes, uh, prior to the American War for Independence, there was a lot of pamphleteering going on. There was a lot of speech. There was a lot of dialogue. Uh, our founders did not see violence as the initial answer to uh, separating from the uh, King of England or, you know, the United Kingdom. They didn't. In fact, it took a lot of dialogue, a lot of failed dialogue before they came to that decision. So, yeah, so information operations isn't anything new. So the Second Amendment, I don't really know that you can keep using the Second Amendment as an argument to keep weapons. Uh, well, most of the people on the gun rights side use the Second Amendment as a legal argument against gun control. We believe that the Second Amendment is a legal restriction on the federal, state, and local governments from imposing more gun control. So there's that. There's also, on the anti-gun side, there's also looking into other countries before the Syrian refugees came over. Looking at, like, Australia and the UK, countries that have really strict gun laws, if not have made guns illegal to possess. Their crime rates before the Syrian refugees started coming over, their crime rates were significantly lower than the United States. Significantly. Like, crazy lower. Like so yes, if you were to look at, say, the homicide rates between the U.S. and the U.K. in the year 2000. It's very easy to get the misperception that gun control is the reason why the U.K. has a much lower homicide rate. Um, but I do want to show you a chart right here real quick. Uh, it's got the homicide rates from, I think, 1900 to 2000 for both the U.S. and the U.K. And I'm going to discuss that after I show it. So the homicide right in blue, that's the U.S. homicide rate, and the homicide rate in red is the U.K. homicide rate. And you can see from the U.S. homicide rate, it's significantly higher than the U.K. homicide rate. Uh, and there's a lot more fluctuation in there. Uh, with the U.K. homicide rate, it's kind of been always low uh, from 1900 to 2000. And when you consider the fact that the UK didn't get a lot of their major gun control laws pushed to the late 1980s and 1990s, 
you really start to see now that uh, it doesn't look like gun control has done anything to slow the homicide rates in the UK. So that's a portion of the information the gun controllers always tend to leave out. And when you just hear the homicide rate for the U.S. and the U.K. in the year 2000, and that's the only information you have to work with, yes, people can get the misconception that maybe gun control has done something for the U.K. when really it hasn't. Whoa, what are we doing? We are fucking up because, like, I saw a statistic before the Syrian refugees, Germany only had 50 murders in one year. Okay, so when it comes to countries like Germany, Australia, the UK, all of these countries, the US, dwarfs in population. Also, it's worth pointing out that you're comparing the US to a country like the UK, it's really an apples to orange comparison. And I pointed this out in previous videos that the UK is a smaller country. It's an island state. The culture is more homogenous, whereas in the US, it's no secret that we have several different cultures in several different locations. I mean, there is no one American culture. There just isn't. Um, <coughs> The way people live in Chicago are a little bit different from the way people live out here in a small town in Texas. Uh, and I'm sure that if I was to go to where you're at, uh, I'm sure the culture there would be much different than, say, if you were to come to where I'm at. Um, the culture would be a lot different here to you than it is in your own home location. So, again, it, it's really an apples to orange comparison here. Some of these countries, that, that their murder rates are like a couple hundred. We're in the thousands. We're thousands and thousands. So, in a lot of these countries, they have a different situation than we do. Uh, if you look, in fact, worldwide, different countries have different issues. Uh, I'll give you one example of an issue we have here down uh, on the southern border. Just to show you this. All right, so the first picture you saw was the counties on the border and the southern border of the United States and the northern border of Mexico. As you can tell, uh, the ones on the northern border and the United uh, on the southern border of the United States have a significantly lower homicide rate than Mexico. Mexico has stringent gun laws, but still, we share a border with one of the more violent countries on the planet, as you can see. With the other chart now, obviously, there are countries with higher homicide rates than Mexico. And in fact, if you look also, I uh, want to point out that Russia has a similar homicide rate to Mexico, and they also have very stringent gun control laws, and Russia is also a G8 country. So, uh, again, taking a few countries and, and pointing out their low homicide rates with gun control, versus the U.S., I mean, there's a lot of information that's being left out, that's not even being considered in this debate. And again, Germany, the U.K., they don't share a border with a country like Mexico. Which Mexico is a very violent place in many parts. And I'm not saying that's because of the gun laws, but there does seem to be a high correlation. And I have to stress that word correlation. If you do not know what correlation means, please look it up. Because it doesn't mean exact. It means there's a coincidence here. That's pretty much what a correlation is. It means there's a coincidence. It seems... Whenever you 
restrict gun rights or take away guns, the crime rate really seems to plummet. Okay, first off, I want to appreciate you specifically talking about what correlation more is because a lot of people on the gun control side of things when they present their numbers a lot of the times they will say well here's this correlation well here's this correlation here and they'll present it as if firearm ownership and firearm rights are the causation which in fact is not the case at all um now i noticed that a lot of the times they will focus on homicide rates and you tend to mention crimes um with the u.s and other countries uh there are a lot of violent crimes that the u.s does not experience at quite the rate that a lot of these other countries do uh, and i'll show you a few charts real quick here uh first one's going to be violent crime rate a u.s versus sweden So, as you can tell, this is violent crime rates. Um, again, at one point, the U.S. was higher than Sweden, and uh, now the U.S. is lower than Sweden. And obviously, there are a lot of factors that go in there. It's not just gun rights versus gun control or firearm ownership versus lack thereof. There are a lot of other factors. And yes, the U.S. and Sweden are very, two very, very different countries in many respects. But... It's kind of hard to put a correlation there with firearm ownership versus violent crimes. And I'll show you another chart real quick. And so again, here you see Sweden leading the uh, charts on the rape rate here. And I understand that this is a few countries here, but it does include Belgium, the U.S. and Norway. Uh, all three countries have similar rate rates according to this chart so again there's really a lot more to the picture so with the last two charts there uh, the first one showed the UK's and several other European countries' violent crime rates and the U.S.'s violent crime rates historically. Now, I know this is a little bit of an apples-to-orange comparison. However, um, it's worth noting that even on the U.S. violent crime rate, historically, it's not gotten near around 2,000 per residence. Uh, so this, again, is also something worth noting. Um, this is something uh, that I wanted to talk about right here on some more deceptive practices before we continue to get into this a little further. Uh, you notice from that chart they only had gun homicides. They didn't want to have the overall homicide rates and you notice with Russia there is no data, but if you've seen from previous charts I put up, Russia has a much higher overall homicide rate than the U.S. And when it comes to homicides, I mean, think about it. Uh, if your good friend was murdered or your mother was murdered or your father was murdered or maybe a child or a niece or a nephew was murdered, um, does it really matter to you that there were weapon that the murderer used i mean are you really going to feel satisfaction knowing that uh well your mother was murdered but at least the murderer didn't use a handgun and i also am very suspect over the no data from russia given the fact that uh you can find a lot of charts with russia having a high homicide rate in general so I'm honestly tempted to believe that the person who put this out either didn't try to find the gun homicide rate for Russia or you know they at least didn't try to look at the Russian homicide rate 
and realize, well, hey, this is still overall much higher than the U.S. So uh, I kind of find that one very suspect. Also in the U.S., there is a disparity in a lot of areas on how the firearms laws are, how much freedom you have versus how many homicides happen. And if you look for a lot of these places that these homicides do happen, a lot of them tend to occur in places where there are stringent firearm laws. Now, obviously, there are a lot of places that don't have stringent firearm laws and you still see some higher homicide rates. But even with that, there's not a correlation, uh, which brings me to my next uh, chart I did want to put out here, too. And that's on the D.C. Now, the red arrow is going to indicate the year the decision uh, of D.C. versus Heller came out. All right, so according to that chart, uh, we see that the homicide rate was generally lower after D.C. versus Heller. And don't get me wrong, D.C. still does have some very stringent firearm control laws. However, in that little bit of an easement on the restrictions, they didn't experience any sort of increase in their homicides despite what the gun controllers would tell you. It's almost like what the gun controllers had to say about national concealed carry reciprocity. They warned of apocalyptic gun battles in the street, vendor benders turning into gunfights and stuff like that. And yet none of these situations have actually materialized. In fact, uh, when concealed carry risk, uh, when shall issue concealed permits started becoming a thing from state to state to state to state, you notice that after they got passed, generally speaking, homicide rates, violent crime rates tended to drop. And again, with this chart, obviously, correlation does not equal causation, but it might shed a little bit more light on the situation as opposed to our firearm laws. So at that point, it's a theory, which would be a really hard theory to test. So we, we can't say definitively. We can't. You're absolutely right. And then the fact that there's a lot of data to take in, historical, current, uh, there are a lot of factors that have to be analyzed and assessed. And when you get into a lot of the research, there are a lot of factors that get left out either intentionally or unintentionally. There are a lot of factors that uh, you can't account for. And really going by case by case is virtually impossible because there's a whole wealth of data that you have to get into with that. So, yeah, there's a lot of data to analyze. I mean, even John Lott, who did go into the subject very much so in depth. In fact, I think out of all the research I've seen, John Lotz is probably the one that has the most data put into the research and has gone over as many factors as they possibly could. So, um, but yeah, even then, the only conclusion he came to on that one was that uh, shall issue uh, concealed carry was actually a good thing, uh, a good thing in preventing crimes. So, yes, this is a very hard topic because there's so many factors and so much data to put into it, just the same as a lot of these other issues that we discuss, oh, both U.S. and worldwide. So there, there is that concept, and people would argue those statistics, the, the pro-gun people would argue those statistics that they're incorrect. Okay, so I don't always argue that these statistics are incorrect. Uh, a lot of the times, they're either cherry-picked, uh, they're presented in a deceptive manner, or they uh, 
and some cases are outright made up. I've seen a few people on the gun control side sit there and say, well, there are 50,000 gun deaths in the U.S. annually, which is an outright fabrication. But here's something I want to get into real quick and, and show you exactly what I'm talking about on uh, their more commonly used number, which is accurate when you talk about firearm related deaths but when you sit there and say this is gun violence it it gets to be a lot more deceptive yes that number is accurate on firearm related deaths but to sit there and say that that's gun violence is a bit misleading and deceptive Given that, I do want to show you a chart that kind of breaks this down, so to put more clarity on the situation. Alright, so we can see right now why it's a little deceptive to call it gun violence. When you get the idea of gun violence, most people think somebody going out and murdering a bunch of other people. And um, we'll cover every issue on the uh, on the chart, and I'll get into a little bit more detail to provide a little bit more clarity on this. Um, with suicides, obviously that takes up the bulk. That's not what you would think uh, when you think traditional gun violence. So, again, that thirty three thousand number is very misleading and i will discuss gun suicides further in this video as well as well as the legal intervention because i know a lot of people on the gun controller side will only use that one percent to ignore all the other firearm related legal interventions just to push their narrative to say well guns are rarely used in self-defense so Again, we'll further get into this chart. Now, this chart, it breaks down the total number of deaths in the U.S. and breaks it down a little bit more by type. And it specifically shows just how negligible, when you think about all the other deaths we have, firearms play in this. And it breaks it down by each type of firearm death as well. When it comes to accidents was the first chart you saw uh, on there going down. Uh, and with the accidents, well, firearm related accidents, well, the deaths anyway, make up a small number of the accidental deaths. So it's really kind of a negligible, negligible number. And I don't think it's something that gun control is going to mitigate what will mitigate firearm related accidents and they are a small number is practices on handling a firearm uh, to have a accidental firearm related death there is a lot of lapse in judgment on this one now there are four basic safety rules when it comes to handling firearms there are four universal rules and actually from those Four basic rules, if you follow uh, at least three of them, you're going to mitigate a lot of your accidental deaths. And I'll explain to you what they are real quick. First off, you don't point a firearm at anything that you're not willing to see destroyed or damaged or killed or injured. The second is you do not put your finger in the trigger well until you are ready to fire. The third is you never assume a firearm is unloaded. You visually verify. And the fourth, and this really applies to if you're shooting to protect yourself hunting or shooting at a target range, and that's be aware of your backstop and what's beyond it. But if people follow those four basic rules, the accidental firearm deaths will drop even more significantly. Now, 
with suicide, you notice that, yes, firearm suicide uh, is a little over the majority of all suicides. However, there's a huge portion of those suicides that are done by other means. And if you also take into account countries like Japan and South Korea have low firearm ownership rates, they have very stringent gun controls, and yet their suicide rates dwarf ours, it's not too far-fetched to understand that people will find other ways to commit suicide if they are intent on committing suicide. Moreover, when Canada, quite a few years back, they passed some more restrictive gun controls, mainly, I think, pertaining to law guns. And what they found out uh, was a lowered youth suicide by shotgun rate and the gun controllers touted that. What they failed to mention was that the overall suicide rate did not change. Moving on to homicides. Now, with homicides, I showed you the chart to where they're concentrated at. There are a lot of those places where they already have strict gun control laws. I mean, and even you look at places like Mexico or even worldwide. There are a lot of countries out there with strict gun control laws and yet have a homicide rate that dwarfs ours. So given that, is there any reason to believe that uh, gun control will really do much of anything to reduce homicides? I mean, I've showed you the chart of the UK homicide rate was virtually unchanged by gun control. When it comes to uh, places like D.C., you know, and I showed you the chart on that one when they lifted the outright handgun ban. Now, they still have strict gun control laws in D.C., but their homicide rates did not jump up when that ban was lifted. In fact, they actually went down. Now, given that, is it too far-fetched to believe that maybe gun control really doesn't do anything to reduce homicides? Here's where I see some deception on defensive gun uses. And you remember the previous chart would had 1% of uh, the firearm related deaths were due to legal intervention, right? And here you see on this chart, they've taken that number and they have used solely that number to say that, well, self-defense with a firearm is rare. And that's very deceptive in my book. And I'm going to show you why here with these charts coming up. Okay, so this chart here shows why that ad was very deceptive. Because as you can see, there are a lot of defensive gun uses that uh, the VPC wasn't taken into consideration. And by the way, depending on whose estimates you listen to, defensive gun uses happen anywhere from half a million times a year, all the way up to 3.5 million times a year. And the estimates vary, just the same as the percentages on this chart will have some variation. I've heard of, well, this chart shows three quarters of the time the defender didn't fire the firearm, they just brandished it. Now I've heard figures up to 92% of the time where the, fire, uh, the defender brandished a firearm and the perpetrator fled. The other percent, uh, second highest percent on this chart was the firearm was fired, but the perpetrator was not hit. The third percent you see on this chart was the perpetrator was hit but wounded. And that don't even show the percentage of the time when the perpetrator was hit and killed because it's such a negligible percent. It's such a negligible number that it's not even worth showing. And 
the reason for that being is you have a firearm to protect yourself. Your goal is not to kill the perpetrator. Your goal is not to be a police officer yourself. You're not out there to go run down suspects or make arrests or anything like that. You have the firearm to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your property. And that's it. That's all it is. I personally don't own a gun. And I'm still on the anti side right now. I don't own a gun. And it's not because I'm afraid I would knock too many people off. It's because... I had a gun once. I found it Urban Exploring. It was a German uh, revolver that uh, was, it was a 1950s one. It actually was kind of an antique. It, its serial number was literally like four digits long. Seriously, I'm not joking. And I found bullets with it too. It had like a little, it came in a little satchel. I found a lot of antiques in there, but I have depression. And I had a really de bad depressive episode that lasted about a couple weeks. I put a bullet in, it was a revolver, I put a bullet in one of the chambers and I, I turned uh, the barrel to where it was, this notch was empty, like on the, on the hammer, the next notch was empty, and the next notch had a bullet. I took the gun and I stuck it in my mouth, and I closed my eyes and I pulled the trigger. And I just listened to the hammer hit the empty slot and echoed in my head. And I imagined what it would be like if I just pulled the trigger one more time and I found an exit. That's when I decided I didn't need to own a gun. Okay, so I say this in all sincerity. I'm glad that you did come forward with this. I'm glad that you yourself can admit that maybe firearm ownership isn't the best option for you and it does take some courage to admit something like that it really does and that's another thing i mean in all sincerity and furthermore those of us on the gun rights side will admit openly that firearm ownership is not for everybody it's not going to be everybody's thing so I appreciate your honesty on this one. Now, with the issue of suicide, man, I, and I'm not just saying this from a gun rights perspective, but on the issue with suicide, it probably would be a good idea to try to seek some help to try to get past that point. Not so you can own a firearm, but more for your own benefit. And really, I'm not that paranoid. I feel like some people, they, they have these crazy guns, and I, it makes me wonder, what are you so paranoid about? Why do you need a gun like that? Like, what, what do you think you're, you need so much self-defense over? What are you defending yourself from? What, what, what's posing such a threat to you? And if something is that much of a threat to you, why aren't we doing something about it? Okay, so... You didn't use the term assault weapon. I'm presuming you're talking about uh, black rifles. And I appreciate you, by the way, not using that term because uh, that's a very misleading, deceptive buzzword, more like term that the gun controllers use to demonize a certain type of rifle, namely the black rifles. Um, now, even Josh Sugarman from the BPC has said that Yes, the term assault weapon is used to mislead people. And I appreciate you not using the term because it shows that you're actually trying to look at both sides of the argument. I'm going to try to keep this as short, as simple as I can on this, merely because I could do a whole series of video on black rifles. They're really more common than you think. Uh, there's a misperception that people who own them are paranoid and such. But that's really not the case at all. It's a very big misconception. Most of my friends who own firearms own at least one, if not more, black rifles. I own quite a few black rifles myself. 
uh, the AR-15 in and of itself is the most popular rifle platform in the United States. It's America's rifle for very good reason. <coughs> it's very customizable. This right here is a Colt LE6920. It's the law enforcement model. It's the closest thing I could get to what I was issued when I was in the United States Army without having to fill out a bunch of NFA Title II paperwork or without uh, breaking some 1986 legislation that prohibits select fire firearms for being available for public use period, regardless of the NFA Title II process. Um, it's a very modular rifle. There's a lot of utility to the rifle. You can use it to hunt. You can use it for personal protection. You can use it for planking. You can use it for three-gun competitions. People collect these things. It's a good rifle to teach people how to shoot with. It's got more utility than most other rifles do. I, in fact, I think when it comes to a wide range of utility, you're not going to find anything comparable to the AR-15 for the most part. Now, on personal protection, this is an excellent rifle for personal protection. This one handles a lot of situations. I mean, about the only thing <coughs> that is impractical about this rifle is using it for concealed carry or everyday carry. That's it. Home defense, it, it's hard to top the rifle. In most DGUs, obviously, there's not a shot being fired. Now, imagine a DGU when someone chose a Smith & Wesson 38 Special on a J-frame versus a rifle like this. What do you think is going to persuade the home invader or home invaders from fleeing uh, quicker? That Smith & Wesson 38 on a J frame or a rifle like this? And let's face fact, in the event that there are multiple home invaders, they may have knives even or baseball bats or even a, maybe a firearm even. And you're looking to protect yourself with a Smith & Wesson 38 Special. And there are even two of them or three of them. You might not, uh, you're probably not going to stand quite the chance if they decide to continue on despite the fact they're saying your firearm. <laughs> this AR-15, you have a much better chance. Now, people will argue, uh, some people will argue, well, why not just use a 12 gauge shotgun with double lock buck? And I agree, it's not a bad choice. Up until you have maybe a smaller statured adult, a senior citizen. And I've seen a lot of adults, well, not a lot, but a few adults who were bigger than me that had trouble handling a 12 gauge shotgun with double lock buck. And in that case, the AR-15 is a superior platform. Um, one other thing I did want to cover on this one, too, because uh, I've heard it being brought up, and that is the zombie apocalypse. Guys, no one in the gun community believes that there's actually going to be a zombie apocalypse when they're talking about their zombie apocalypse gun. That's just a hobby gun. You know? It's just harmless fun at the range it, and that's just it so i'm going to continue on with the video uh, on this one because i can go on all day about black rifles that that's my thought process process on that so we all kind of go we get a little sad we've all I, whether you have depression or not I'd be willing to bet the majority of people out there have had a suicidal thought at one point in their life. On this one, man, I mean, I understand, again, in all sincerity, what you went through. Um, 
and those were your experiences. Uh, now, here's a chart I could find, and again, this can be completely way off base here, but I'm going to show the chart anyway. Again, I have no idea on the accuracy of these numbers. I know I don't have suicidal thoughts. Not many people have expressed suicidal thoughts to me. I'm not a mind reader. I can't tell. On, I do know they happen, obviously. Uh, the vast majority of our firearm-related deaths are suicides, and there are only a slight majority of the suicides, a, a very slight majority of our nation's suicide. So, people do commit suicide. Yes. I would argue that if your sole solution is taking away somebody's gun, <coughs> you're not really helping out the problem. And in fact, I think we need to look to other ways to try to help people who are struggling with hard times. I'll admit, I mean, we all have our times where we're not happy where we're at or, you know, we're not, or we're feeling pretty shitty in life. Let's put it that way. I can't vouch for everyone else on what to do to make them happy or, you know, to get past those times. I really don't know. I think that people have some differences and how they handle things, and, and what works for them, really. I mean, me, personally, I know that whenever I'm feeling bad uh, and, and stuff like that, you know, trying to take my guns away from me is going to be a pretty bad choice. Let's put it this way. Uh, you know, I personally am not the type of person who wants to give up their firearms and even if you try to take all my firearms from me, you know, you're not going to find them all. I got too many. But I will tell you one of the things that, to me, always cheers me up is a day at the range, you know. I don't think I noticed too many days where a <laughs> day at the range, I didn't come away feeling pretty great, you know, or pretty happy, you know. I'll tell you shooting this gun right here, this crazy gun right here. Uh, that's one of the things that brings a smile to my face every time. Unfortunately, the rounds for these are not quite so common and they're expensive, but I still love shooting it. And, you know, actually, probably for good reason. I mean, you look at the rounds it shoots, it's 50 AE, and compare it next to a 9 by 19 you can see why the rounds are so expensive and not many people have them or not many people have a firearm chamber for that um so on suicide the best answer is on that one is try to help out the people who are suicidal let you know i mean do everything you can to get them help don't just Try to make sure you've got all their firearms and leave. It, you know, gun control isn't going to help this out. I mean, and from all my suicide prevention training I had when I was in the Army, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things I always said is don't leave this person alone unattended because they will find a way to commit suicide if they're serious about it. But the liberal in me starts saying, but you're taking away people's freedom. All right, so I appreciate you mentioning that because there are a lot of gun controllers out there that refuse to even acknowledge that you're taking away people's freedom with gun control. So, again, I appreciate you mentioning that. Another aspect that I look at is when you do look at the Syrian refugee problem where you have homosexuals and women being harassed and raped and, and people being stabbed in the street and buildings being bombed and all kinds of violent activity. And then I think we've had a few things here in the United States, nowhere near the amount that the UK has been experiencing, nowhere near. 
And that could be because we have an ocean between us, and they don't. However, can you imagine somebody patrolling the streets trying to enforce global Sharia and global Islam on a group of gang members trying to sell drugs and drinking an alcohol and doing things that aren't uh, okay in their religion. Okay, so there is a little bit of a misconception I might have picked up here on the concealed carry deal. Um, first thing is, is that, uh, yes, in the U.S. and really anywhere, gang members that want to carry and, you know, have a pistol or can get a pistol will do so regardless of what the law states. That's just plain and simple. Um, doesn't matter if you're MS-13, Crip, Blood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're going to do so no matter what the law says. And yes, it is going to be a much, much worse day for, say, uh, some of these wannabe Sharia police over here if they try to pull that stunt on some gangbangers as opposed to unarmed law-abiding citizens. Now, on the concealed carry side, yes, it varies state to state. Uh, most states are shallow. You get to places like uh, New Jersey or California. That's a May issue. And even in California, the May issue varies from shall issue in some counties just about to never issue in other counties such as LA and San Francisco. However, law-abiding citizens caring to protect themselves would also kind of put a little bit of a wrench in those who want to enforce Sharia laws plans as is as well. So just wanted to point that out. I don't agree with violence. I want nothing to do with it. But you know, the, those if you have civilians packing heat in the United States, these people come over here and they start trying to stab a homosexual in the street. Bam! They have more of a threat over here because we do have guns. And I do mean this in all sincerity. I'm glad that you actually bring this up. Uh, it's a good thing. A lot of people won't recognize that one in fact actually one of my good friends is openly homosexual and he has his concealed carry permit and he has his concealed carry permit to protect himself uh, against not only hate crimes but really any type of crime that might be perpetrated against him and uh i think pink pistols are doing great things this is a right for everybody so, again, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I think Americans in general have a bad attitude. I think the UK per perpetuates the idea of being cordial and having civility and being polite. Here in the United States, it's fuck, 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 shit, fuck, fuck, shit, fuck. And yes, I agree that there is, generally speaking, a huge cultural difference between the U.S. and Brits, or Americans and Brits. Um, I do think, though, that uh, the description of our cultures may be a little bit more overgeneralized, again, because we have several different cultures in several different parts of the country. But... I think it's important to recognize the fact that there are cultural differences between the two countries. There is a group in the pro-gun rally that a lot of people overlook, and it's really quite sad. There's a lot of people that want to keep their guns because they like catching their own food. Okay, uh, for hunters, for the most part, or at least the ones at home with firearms, for the most part of this debate, a lot of them haven't really had the gun controllers going after them. The gun controllers 
have primarily been going after firearms that were intended for self-defense uh, or firearms that may have had a more of a military type purpose, stuff like that. So uh, again, the firearm owners who have them for hunting that have the both action rifles and muzzle loaders and stuff like that, they really haven't been under that much of a threat. And there's a subset of those people that do kind of tick me off. I, I hunt myself, but to me, those people who say, well, we shouldn't have all these AR-15s or these handguns. Why would you need a gun to defend yourself and stuff like that? And yeah, you can go ahead and take them all away as long as I get to keep my hunting rifle. Well, I'm really not too fond of that type of crowd. We call them fudders in the gun community. So, yeah. Now to the neutral ground. So I don't really want to take the rights away. I don't really think that we should take freedoms away. I don't like that idea. However, I can't ignore the fact that there is a high correlation between crime and guns. And yes, if you make them illegal, you can still buy them on the black market. Okay, yeah, that's true. All right, so here's one of my issues uh, with simply saying something is neutral ground. And I know a lot of us on the gun rights side of things have, some, uh, have a similar issue with this. The fact of the matter is, is that every time we pass one of these neutral restrictions, there's always one more that comes up that's just neutral and reasonable and common sense. You know, it's almost like the gun control side of this seems to never be satisfied. I mean, in the 90s, in the 90s, just two decades ago, we passed a whole bunch of restrictions and now we have even more that we just have to have because they're reasonable and common sense and we have to have them because our current gun laws are too lax and too insane whereas if we went back to 1933 before we had the NFA of 34 these restrictions we're talking about now would have been way out and left field, so to speak. They would have been considered really extreme in 1933 to go from those sets of laws to the sets of laws we have now and that were being proposed. The gun control laws we have in this country were not passed overnight. Moreover, when we had that uphill battle for shall issue concealed carry in the 80s and 90s, you know, and not all states have shall issue concealed carry, but the vast majority of them do now. There were a lot of, oh, there are going to be apocalyptic gun battles in the streets, and it almost seemed like we had to try to do what we could to prove that those weren't going to happen. And even after they didn't happen, you didn't hear a peep from the gun control side of, oh, well, we're sorry, we're wrong. More like it now with national concealed carry reciprocity being discussed, and it has been discussed for almost a decade now, if not longer. Um, that's facing a lot of opposition there, too, and they're using a lot of the same arguments that they did against shall issue concealed carry even though if national concealed carry reciprocity gets passed, I guarantee you none of these scenarios are going to manifest themselves or materialize themselves. Now we have an issue. Uh, another bill that we've been trying to get put through is the HPA, the Hearing Protection Act. Basically the bill to move sound suppressors from NFA Title II to NFA Title I. And that's you know, by the gun control side and a lot of people who consider themselves neutral to be, oh, no, you can't do this. You know, there are a lot of gun control groups that 
try to falsely paint themselves out to be neutral when anybody who's been paying attention to this debate knows that they're not neutral. I don't know if these gun control groups realize that they're not really neutral or not really moderate. Those of us on the gun control, uh, gun rights side, we know they're not neutral. We know they're not moderate. So, I mean, on that part, yeah, I think we're going to end up disagreeing on what exactly is neutral and what exactly is moderate. But here's the way that I look at it. There's been people that have talked about the, the block list, blacklist. If you've been blacklisted, you can't purchase a weapon. Okay, so you're talking about the terror watch list and the no-fly list, which, by the way, the terror watch list is a much broader list than the no-fly list, but people on the no-fly list cannot fly. Now, I have an issue with that, and actually, not to appeal to authority, but the ACLU has an issue with both lists, period. And I'm not a fan of either list, period, as well. Because both of them deprive our people of due process as it is. Now, both lists are secret. In fact, the no-fly list is even more secretive than the no-watch list. So you can't even tell the criteria on how you get on the no-fly list. What we do know is that children have been put on the no-fly list. The late Senator Ted Kennedy was put on the no-fly list. Now, as much of a jackass as this guy was, and as much of a bullet as he dodged in Chappaquiddick, it would be really far-fetched to think that this guy was going to get on a plane to blow it up or commit a terrorist act while he was alive and on that list. So, I mean, you kind of start to see how ridiculous that list is, and... Really, I mean, even with a terror watch list, from the best information I've found about it, to be on that list, you don't have to have been suspected of committing a previously committed crime or terror act. They don't even have to know or have an idea of what terror attacks you might commit in the future. They don't even have to suspect you of possibly committing the terror act yourself, they just have to suspect you of being somehow, some way, in some shape or form affiliated with terrorism. And it seems like the way to get on that list is very broad. And from what I understand, over a million people were on that list last I heard. Uh, again, I could be mistaken, and not to appeal to authority, but the ACLU is opposed to using either of those lists to deprive people of their legal ability to own a firearm, and this is the ACLU. Now, given that, in this country, we're supposed to have a principle of, you know, before we deprive anybody of their life, liberty, or their pursuit of happiness, they have to be convicted of a crime and they have to be given due process under the law. And that liberty that is taken from them or their life has to be already prescribed by law. And with that terrorist watch list or using the no-fly list to make somebody a prohibited person, it's just further violating that principle we have. So, yes, I do have a problem with not just using those lists to uh, deprive somebody of their firearm ownership, but that no-fly list shouldn't even be in place to begin with if you ask me, too, on that one. Well... I think there should be some gun control. I don't think that they should be taken away. And we actually do have quite a bit of gun control laws in this country as is. The issue that 
many on my side of the aisle believe is that we have gone maybe a little too far on some of the gun control laws and really a lot of the further restrictions that are being proposed are going to do more to deprive people who should not be deprived of firearm ownership from being deprived of owning firearm ship. Uh, there's the Lautenberg Amendment, uh, which under the Lautenberg Amendment, anybody convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence is a prohibited person. I think that went a little too far because anything, you know, that you would see as being somebody who's going to actually injure or kill their spouse seriously or, you know, a serious wife beater or serious stalker. I mean, a lot of those things are already felonies as is. I know in Texas, you punch somebody in the face on the street and you know, or even a friend, and, you know, they're not a cohabiting girlfriend or a wife. I mean, that falls under the category of a Class A misdemeanor. But the second you do it to a wife or a cohabiting girlfriend, now that's a felony. And you're a prohibited person for that. It's, you know, it makes it domestic violence and it makes it a felony. Whereas a lot of the things that happen under misdemeanor domestic violence are stuff like raising your voice or, you know, hitting a wall or something like that. So, uh, again, I think there's a misconception on that one. Another prime example when you brought up uh, the terror watch list or the no-fly list. I mean, how many people are on those lists that shouldn't be on those lists in the first place? But we're going to arbitrarily say you can no longer have this freedom because Someone, somewhere in an office and the government decided that they don't even suspect you of having committed a crime. They don't even know that you will commit a crime in the future. Or they don't have any reason to suspect you will commit an actual act of crime in the future. We just think, you know, that somewhere, somehow, some way you may be affiliated with a terrorist group. And by the way, I remember the DHS watch list that came out in 2009. I mean, so I do not put it past any official to sit there and abuse the hell out of that just to take more guns away from more people or take more firearms away from people who are their political opponents just to punish them. And, you know, given some of the people in the gun control side demanding the NRA be classified as a terrorist organization, even though they don't advocate violence. They don't conduct actual terrorist attacks. Given that, there's too much potential for abuse for that, too. Another prime example with the uh, permit to purchase scheme they have in New Jersey. Yet, uh, cost, it might have been the thing that cost Carol Bone her life. And by the way, Carol Bone was somebody who was being stalked and she was getting her and she had her permit to purchase. She'd been waiting on it. And while she was waiting on it, her ex came in and stabbed her to death. And had she had that pistol, the situation might have turned out differently. You know, gun free zones are another way I think we've gone overboard with these laws. So again, I mean, we do have a good deal of gun control laws in this country. And in fact, in some areas, I think we've gone overboard on them. So that's food for thought. But I think there should be some control, some limitations. There's been some guns out there that I've seen that people can buy on the open market. Buying on the black market would be a different story. Like it's, it would be illegal in all kinds of essence. But you, you got to realize at one point that some guns are just meant to kill people. And again on that one, you know, we've tried prohibiting this gun, that gun, in some areas of the country. We actually do have a private prohibition on machine guns manufactured after 1986. Prior to 1986, you have to go through the NFA Title II process to purchase. Um, just a simple fact of the matter is, is that those 
bills that are currently being proposed won't do anything to change our homicide rates. There's a lot you would have to trick yourself into believing before, you know, you actually could believe that that bill is honestly a good bill that would reduce our homicide rates or that would even be right. In fact, I think we do need to scale back on a lot of our gun control bills, such as the post-1986 prohibition. But I, I do think that there should be a background check. I think there are people with mental illnesses out there, people that are mentally unstable. And anytime you go to an FFL to purchase a firearm, you do have to receive a background check. If you're purchasing a firearm online, that firearm gets shipped to an FFL, you go in and you get a background check. Uh, if you're purchasing at a gun show, likewise. Now, there are there's one exemption to that, and this is the one gun controllers don't talk about. Like here in Texas, I have a CHL, a concealed handgun license. So whenever I go into an FFL, all I do is fill out the 4473 form, uh, which everyone has to fill out when they purchase from an FFL regardless. And um, I can purchase the firearm without the next check you know, without having to spend the 15 or more dollars for the next check. Now, <clears throat> what the gun controllers are talking about are what they call private transfers, person-to-person -person transfers, such as Johnny, if they decide they're tired of their, I don't know, say Glock, but Jimmy, their friend, decides he wants to buy that Glock from them, Okay, Johnny's allowed to transfer that firearm to them, given a few things. First off, Johnny and Jimmy have to be the resident of the same state. Second, Johnny cannot have known of or should have known of that little Jimmy was a prohibited person, if Jimmy is. And the other conditions, if Jimmy's a prohibited person and he goes and does that, he is also breaking the federal law. Now, a lot of private transfers go on among people that know each other as well. Meaning, you know, all right, I'll give you an example. I loan my guns to friends a lot. I loan my guns to a few relatives here and there. Now, the issue we'll have with this is that, okay, do we really need to go in and pay $15 every time one of us transfers a firearm to the other and then gets it back? Really, is that necessary? Come on. Now, how it's ineffective is how are you going to enforce that? Really, I mean, how precisely are you going to enforce that? Think about the person who already knowingly goes in there and purchases a firearm for somebody he, he knows, he or she knows is a prohibited person. Do you think they're going to give a damn about that law requiring a background check now too? No, they're not. And in fact, about the only way to enforce that law is to do exactly what the NRA said would happen, which means the NRA isn't quite so paranoid after all. You'd have to concede that. And that is universal registration. And even then, how do you enforce that? Do you go to people's houses and say, okay, well, we understand that you've registered this gun, this gun, and this gun. Um, we'd like to see them. Well, the thing is, is that you're going to have a very hard time doing that even too. You know, so, I mean, where does it end? And moreover, there's a good chance that if Mr. Bad Guy was purchasing that firearm to either rob somebody, rape somebody, or kill somebody with, there's a good chance that they're not going to get caught until after it's too late anyway. So, there you have it on that. So, anyway... 
Let me know what you think. Okay, so I appreciate you doing the video. I appreciate you being honest uh, and trying to actually look at the other side of the issue and giving a good thought to the other side of the issue. I think you're looking for the facts and you're trying to make the most informed opinion you can on the issue. And for that, I appreciate. There are a lot of people on the anti side, I think, aren't really looking for that, aren't really looking for that uh, good discussion. I think you're a little bit different in most respects. And anybody else who is a little bit more on the pro gun control side, I'm always willing to have a civil discussion on the issue. And, you know, uh, again, with part of me, on civil, when I say civil, you know, obviously honesty. Honesty is a big part of that discussion because without honesty, you can't really have a civil debate. And I do believe that the First Amendment, our freedom of speech, is one of the cornerstones to our Bill of Rights. It's one of the things that helps keep society free. Just the same as the right to keep and bear arms, the right to due process before convicted of a crime, the right to protection against unreasonable search and seizures. All of the Bill of Rights is important to me, just the same as the Constitution. All right, uh, Jinx, I look forward to hearing what you have to say in the future. I know I've got a lot of pro-Second Amendment videos on this channel as is. I particularly wanted to tailor a response particular to what you're saying to address specifically what you're saying and to have a discussion with you on the issue. I'm open to doing that with just about anybody who is more pro-gun control than not. Um, and again, uh, on the responses, I mean, sometimes you have to send it to me yourself because I might not always catch them. I know it took me a while to catch this video. Um, so y'all take her easy out there and have a great day.